and welcome to But I Digress, the show where sometimes my mouth goes faster than my brain. I am your host, Nathan. Call me Nate Marchand. And this week I'm trying something a little bit different. I'm having a round table. And if you, uh, for my new novella, Destroy, well, it's not really new. Uh, it was published a few years ago, and I have now migrated it from Lulu to Create Space and now have made a new deluxe edition of it that includes a bonus story. And with me today are my partners in crime who worked on that particular novella. You guys can introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Tim Vigil. I'm Natasha Hayden. I'm Nick Hayden. Okay, so well, I thought we would do a roundtable where we talk about our experiences working on that novella, even though it was quite some time ago for, <laughs> for all of us here. So we may have to blow some dust off of the memory banks there. But overdrawn. <laughs> overdrawn, please, no. <laughs> anyway, so uh, to begin, um, this was something that we started, I believe it was around 2008 or so. We got a, was the, the four of us plus some of our other writer friends, and we went to Story, Indiana. Yes, such a place exists. It's over by... Brown County State yep. Park, beautiful place. It is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we stayed there. We stayed at a cabin for a weekend mm -hmm. and just hung out. And then we decided that we would try to plan out some sort of a big year-long project for all of us yeah. to do as a group. And what we settled on was actually your suggestion, Nick, which was something called. Probably the Pulp. I'm guilty for that. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> the Pulp Fiction Project, where we would just have some fun and write stories that you would see in old dime store novels or in pulp magazines uh, you know back in the 30 yeah. 20s 30s 40s about that era and you know and then what we would do is we each we were going for about 30,000 word about novellas total, yeah. yeah and then so we would each pick one and then we'd write you know 8 10,000 words for each section and then after we do that for a couple months we'd have another another meeting and then we would draw names from a hat yep and then that per whoever drew that had to write for that particular title. It's also a way to try to get us to expand our horizons and write in genres that we weren't necessarily familiar with or hadn't really delved into, which we'll get into in a few minutes. And when we made the list of potential stories, one of them was Monster, and I selected that one, to which our mutual friend Aaron Brosman said, that means you could write everything from Frankenstein to Godzilla. So I decided to do both. When I was initially conceptualizing this, I, I should remind everybody that uh, I'm a big fan of kaiju movies. I love Godzilla movies. They're my guilty pleasure. And the initial kernel of, an, of the idea for Destroyer came from a Godzilla movie called, I think it was called Godzilla Against Mechagodzilla from the early 2000s. They had this concept where you had this giant cyborg that was built to kill Godzilla that included a CPU that was a brain cloned from Godzilla cells. But halfway through the movie, it goes berserk and defies the humans, but then the humans get it back under control after about five minutes, and it never goes berserk again. And I seriously yelled at the TV when I was watching this because I thought this was an idea that was rife with potential, and you wasted it. So I decided that I would write a similar sort of story but actually do something with the idea. So when I was crafting the characters, I was using a lot of old B-movie and uh, horror movie tropes, especially, yeah, I guess especially with the characters. So you had the, uh, the scientist, mm -hmm. his beautiful assistant, who is also his daughter. I had a Japanese character, because you can't have a kaiju story without a Japanese character. Well, you Not can, man, but, it, but it makes it even better. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I had a gung-ho military commander, and I had a character whose sole purpose was really to kind of be the wild card because he was wigging out and losing his yeah. mind because you see that in a lot of old B-movies and horror movies. There's funny. always someone who's just going crazy so that there's not just the outside threat but the threat within the group yeah. that, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And I also, I did create a sixth character but I did hardly anything with him and that's where Natasha comes in. Natasha. <laughs> Because you were a bit nervous when you drew uh, when you drew that title. Oh, I remember that. Oh yes, <laughs> I didn't really want to do the monster story. Anything but the monster story. <laughs> Even Nick's barbarian, you would rather have had that. Maybe not. 
<laughs> she, she threw a lot of ideas against me for a long time. She's yeah. Like, what are we doing? Well, I mean, first, you, you got to understand, her, Natasha's contribution to this big project was uh, was what a Victorian drama. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that just that shows you how diametrically different this was. <laughs> but one of the things I remember telling you to help you get through this and not be as intimidated is focus on the characters because the story, yes, it's crazy and it has a big monster and all this sci-fi craze craziness but it's a, at, at its core it's about the characters right. and I think that's what really helped you in writing that oh yeah I love characters so that was right up my alley it's perfect yeah so the probably the biggest contribution you made when you were writing it was you took that sixth character I hadn't even named it the, uh, he was a Russian military. It was a it was a Russian soldier. The, the enemy. Basically. Yeah, yeah, because the because the the cyborgs created to end a war, and one of the opposing forces in this war is the Russians. It takes the story takes place in Moscow, and after the handlers for the cyborg are stranded in Moscow, they run into a soldier. He can't speak any English. They don't trust him, and I told you he's a blank slate. You can do whatever the heck you want with him. And then she took him in directions I never expected. <laughs> Can you tell everybody about that? Um, well, let's see if I can remember. <laughs> it's been so long. I haven't read it in forever. But, um, yeah, he became basically the romantic uh, interest for the story, which um, didn't really have anything like that yet. Um, so I took the daughter, her, her name was Ava. Ava, right. And um, made them, even though they couldn't really speak to each other, um, kind of made them love interests. Um, and I named the character was Sasha, right? Yes. After uh, my parents' dog. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, hey, it worked for George Lucas and Indiana Jones. Why not? <laughs> but um, yeah, I just like the name. Everybody thinks it's a girl's name, but in Russia, it's a guy's name. So. Really? I would have figured it was a unisex name, but I remember when I read it your might be. when I read your section, I was thrown. I was like, "Why did you give him a girl's name?" <laughs> <laughs> sort of like Pat. Yeah, yeah it could it could go either like way. Names around here, huh? It, well, Natasha? yeah. <laughs> Less Natasha. Our son is Theodore, so. Yeah, the, I'm detecting a bit of a theme. Yes, but. Uh, you also did a fair amount of world building with it too, which I was a little surprised by. You did a lot of research on Moscow, even though this is a futuristic story. You were referencing streets and landmarks that were real landmarks. I think the church. I know you figured out where that was on the map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I had. Yeah, I did a lot of research because I was like, I don't know, I don't know that corner of the world, and I really don't know monster stories, so I might as well focus on something real. <laughs> yeah, the interesting thing is that in your section, I think, I think the creature doesn't show up very much. I mean, it has a presence, right? But you really took my advice. You really focused on the characters, and you made their story move ahead. Yeah. And you know, so the creature just showed up at, you know, at convenient times to add some tension and such. Yeah, and the, the creature really isn't even the villain in my part of the story. <laughs> Not really. I have another villain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, you ran with the uh, you ran with the insane character yes. quite well, and was he was freaky. You actually kind of turned it into more of a traditional horror story <laughs> at that point. But you were reading a lot of Ted Decker at the time. <laughs> I love Ted Decker. Yes. <laughs> Although probably the funniest part for me out of the whole thing, because seriously, she predicted something. Because this is set about 75 years or so in the future. And she, I would have thought it would have been someone like me making this reference. You referenced Star Wars. Not only do you reference Star Wars, you said there were nine movies. Oh. <laughs> oh, That's yeah. Right. I <laughs> guess okay. yeah, it, was just, it was a throwaway line. It's a nice little nerd <laughs> joke or something yeah. like that. When I was right. surprised that she was the one making it. And now guess what? There will be nine movies. <laughs> At least nine. At least nine, <laughs> At least yeah. nine movies. So she saw it coming. <laughs> I should have put a higher number. <laughs> I should have said like 15. <laughs> <laughs> but it was also because you're also kind of drawing a bit of a parallel because there's this humorous scene between Sasha and Ava where she's like, what was she, was she making bandages? Or something for him, and she had to like tear off part of her right. shirt oh, yes. to do that it. That happens all the time. The <laughs> yeah. She's like tearing off part yeah. of her shirt, and you know, yeah, to try to make a bandage for him. And she's, 
making, she was kind of making jokes to herself, the character. It was almost exactly. meta, kind of. Yeah. So, and then after that, it went to Tim. Way to finish it all up. Yeah, yeah, to wrap it all. Almost went to Nick, but it ended up going to Tim. Yeah, because, so Nate had wrote the beginning, and Natasha wrote the middle, and then I, I took on the end. And so, basically, my goal for that was just to kind of, you know, obviously wrap everything up. But also, I really wanted to make sure uh, each character sort of got the ending they deserved, in a sense. Whether that was a, a good ending or a bad ending um, for them. And... That was kind of, I'm not going to, you know, say anything about who got what. Yeah, so uh, it, might be, it might be a little bit difficult for you to talk about <laughs> some yeah. of your stuff because you wrote the end and we, we kind of have a strict no spoilers yeah. warning. Right, right. Yeah, well, it's policy, I should say, especially since the last time I tried to get spoilers, one of mm -hmm. the characters actually called me up and threatened to kill me. So, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> when I was doing my Children of the Wells video, I can't remember, it was like episode 14 or something like yeah. that. But but it, and it was an interesting challenge because at that point I had really only written short stories or I had written a few chapters for uh, co-author projects like this one but it had been part of a continuing story so I mean just the the finality of like okay you have to figure out how all this ends was uh, yeah. was a good challenge and, it, and I, you I, had some guidelines though because one of the yeah. things we did I forgot to mention at the big uh, for the beginning of the project is the original authors when they you know they started the first section mm -hmm. they could give I think it was three I don't know if they were I don't know if you could say their rules or guidelines they were yeah they were in between kind of like yeah don't yeah don't like anything. like it was like we would like to see these happen but other than those parameters, the subsequent authors could do whatever the heck they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so you had those kind of as a guidepost yeah. for and, you. And I was able to build off things that Natasha had done and some ideas from just, you know, the way the characters had been set up that kind of kind of helped, yeah, direct where I felt like, okay, this is kind of the natural end for this person. Uh, this, this person deserves this because of what they've done before and, and stuff like that. And I guess in terms of influences, I hadn't seen as many Godzilla myself as as you had, but I I kind of went with a lot more uh, action theme type stuff. I included, I think there's a bit of a King Kong influence in there. There definitely yeah. is. In fact, it, your section yeah. is actually what inspired the cover art, pretty much, well, yeah. because <laughs> the the tower where the climax is is what that is on the cover. Yeah, and that's yeah. an actual tower in, in, yeah. in Russia. I looked up like he did research too. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I looked up like street names and how to get yeah, things like that. that but no, but you had, I had a specific location in mind for it. Yeah, yeah and so you, there was that, and oh, what was? I, there were points where I seriously thought you were trying to turn Sasha into kind of like a Russian Rambo. At <laughs> points too, it's like it's like he goes through an interesting little arc. First, he's like the guy no one really trusts. He shows up last minute, then he's kind of this romantic hero in part two, and then he turns into Russian Rambo <laughs> in part three. <laughs> what can I say? I, I like my action heroes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, who doesn't? You know? So, but it was, and it was a very valuable experience later on for when I actually did write a full novella, you know, even though, you know, obviously it wound up being much longer, but because I kind of had mm -hmm kind of had this one under my belt, I felt a little more confident in writing yeah, cause I, you Will's Rising, which is available from www.wills.com. <laughs> so, we all love our shameless self-promotions. <laughs> so, because I think you told me at one point that actually was probably the longest single thing you had written. Well, okay. certainly the longest uh, fictional that I've written, and probably at that point, yeah, it might have been the long, I don't remember if it was longer than my senior paper in college or not. Well, or not, yeah, because you're been. you're kind of you're kind of the weird one in this group <laughs> of weirdos because all of us are writers and we you know we've all written books that are seventy eighty thousand words if you're Nick it's one hundred and fifty and yet <laughs> I'm saying what's book three of Strange <laughs> that'll be more one hundred yeah something like that so. 80. Yeah, so all of us were kind of used to that, and you, on the other hand, not so much. Yeah, well, I mean, it was, a sh I mean, what I did was a shorter section of the, of the, I think actually in each of the things I did for the Pulp Fiction project, mine was probably one of the shorter ones, yeah, maybe not always, but a lot of them. Um, yeah. But I think it still managed to wrap things up pretty well, and I had a, a I, was, I was happy to be able to put 
an epilogue on it. It's kind of the the bow. The mm-hmm. kind of talk mm-hmm. about what took place after all the calamity had yeah. had settled down. And I can't. I've already had at least one person. It was actually the cover artist for the book insist that I write a sequel. <laughs> and I'm like, how the heck am I going to get a sequel? Unless I, I don't. I want to avoid doing a retcon. So I'm just like, I have to. Like pull a Doctor Who to even have a chance to do a sequel. Well, instead of a sequel, you, did, you had commissioned a spinoff story. Yes, I did, and that's where Nick comes in. Hi. You actually made a much more recent addition yes. to this, and kind of a unique addition. Yeah. Well, well Nathan had, and had suggested doing some uh, kind of a short story swap where he would write a story in one of my fictional worlds, and I'd write one in his. And I thought, oh, I'll write something in uh, Destroyer because, well. When Natasha was brainstorming, she had, you know, she had all, she didn't know how to deal with the monster, and I'm like, how the, egg? and if you, I brainstormed by just throwing ideas out there, and one of my ideas was early on, like the first chapter, there's this T-Rex that's kind of frozen in state, and and kind of throw away, and there's these alien crystals that do it, and I thought, well that's interesting, what's what's up with these alien crystals, um, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm sure there's a story there somewhere. So I thought about it, I remember taking a couple walks, listening to music, that's how I brainstorm best when I have a good idea. And thinking, okay, what what kind of story would show up with these crystals that kind of freeze, you know, people kind of animate, a suspended animation. Um, and so it came out with this short story called uh, House of Living, which is really more of a tangential story. It really doesn't have to do, do anything with... There are references the, to the, no, to yeah, the novel. Yeah, it's certainly really connected, but it, not have to do, it doesn't have to do with the monster himself, more of other technology that came out of the same... Or from the same starting point that the monster came yeah, out Yeah, you pretty much you, you lash onto... Not necessarily a throwaway line, it's kind of an expository line yeah. from an early chapter about Dr. Steiner, the scientist who created the cyborg, saying that my mineralogical friends are having a heyday with this with this mineral. Mineral. And then I'm like, ah, oh, okay, we'll see what we do with this. And so it's this very I don't know how to describe the short story exactly. But it, it's it's largely a series of of re- recollections about what's happening to the guy who's studying it and other things in his life. It's almost like Philip K. Dick wrote a short story based <laughs> off a Godzilla movie. <laughs> in a weird way, I, when I read it, I, I kind of looked at it and I thought, this is, this is kind of like, it's pulpy, but not quite. It's literary, but not quite. It's like this <laughs> yeah. really weird, squishy middle that I didn't yeah. know existed between those... <laughs> Which you think is very you good know, those at mindsets. Those, those I, I'm really good at finding like the the genre that doesn't quite exist and squeezing it in there. <laughs> so. Which is one of the reasons why I loved it. I was mesmerized by it when I was when I was reading it. I was just. I, but then I, again, I, I tend I tend to gush on Nick anyway. But well, I did hear a lot of people say it was kind. Of, it's kind of some of the feedback I got from people were like it's kind of creepy, kind of gets under your skin. You know, it's just kind of unsettling. Haunted, unsettling. Yeah, I guess that would be the best word. Um, which. Uh, it was hard to write because it's very nonlinear in some ways. Um, it's incredibly nonlinear. What are you talking I mean, there, about? I mean, there is a linear of thread, but there's a lot of back and forth. But yeah. I, anyway, I, but it's an interesting story. Yeah, and but it's hard the to thing, say much more than that. Well, yeah, but the thing is, is that the I don't you don't really get a grasp of the linearness of it until you get to the end. Yeah. That's one of the things I think is one of the, you know, the, if I may say it, it's one of the genius things about the story, <laughs> is that it reads really weird. It does read you know, really it, weird. And it's like, Give us this, is, <laughs> this is kind of abstract, it is very Philip K. Dickish, and then you get to the end, it's like, oh, wait, that actually was a really linear story. <laughs> you, know? you just don't realize it until the end. Rather Christopher Nolan. <laughs> there you go. Maybe it, it's I haven't built. seen Interstellar yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's been bugging me for a while. Except it's not three hours long. But it's, yeah. Yeah. No. It's, pre- it's a pretty short story, actually. It's like 3,000 words, 4,000? Yeah. Something, Something like that. So it's still it shorter than my section. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I really enjoyed writing it. I remember seeing when I was writing it, was, it was hard being like, because the scenes are really compacted and there are lots of little scenes kind of right run after Yeah, that. I know that. And it, I'm like, I, uh, it was almost like having to feel out, okay, what's happening? What's the next scene that fits here? Because it wasn't, it was more emotionally connected each scene then. Yeah. 
than yeah, the it, plot. That, that, I mean, it's not. There's not a lot of plot. Um, like most, <laughs> which isn't necessarily a bad thing. No, I mean there is plot, but yeah, it's certainly driven by the emotion of the character. Yeah, which was also made it a bit challenging because when you sent me the file and I was adding it to the to the main file to make it to a PDF and load on yeah. the create space. It didn't save the scene breaks. Oh. I copied and pasted it in there, so I was like, <laughs> so I had to go through and like make sure I got yeah, the scene there's breaks. Yeah, a lot of breaks. Which is, like, yeah, which is like, why I sent up. sent it to you and said, Nick, please just glance through this and make sure I got the scene well, breaks. I like right. that. I probably should have read it then, but no, <laughs> <laughs> I've been read it for a while. I really shouldn't see that. Yeah. So yeah, so, yeah. My short story is going to be a little timey wimey. So. <laughs> I think you've made more co pop culture references than all the rest of us put together in this. Uh, in, in this <laughs> Actually, podcast. all that under data pop culture, <laughs> yeah, but, which is kind of funny. But anyway, so there you go. I hope that uh, whets your appetite to give this a try. Like I said, the book is available on CreateSpace.com. I'll have a link to it in the video description. You can also find some more info about it on my website, NathanJSMarchand.com, and all of you also have websites. Yep. Would you like to plug those before we go? Uh, the works of Nick.com where you can find other short stories of mine and books and random musing. Um, I have a blog where I review movies and books, usually nothing to do with Godzilla. Um, <laughs> that is uh, natashashelf.blogspot.com. I guess I don't actually have my own website currently, not yet anyway, but I do a lot of the work for a podcast that Nick and I co-host. Yeah. You do all the work. I just show up and talk. <laughs> and <laughs> well, occasionally I steal the show. Well, and you, you load it on. Oh, uh, yeah, stuff. I do the technical stuff sometimes. Yeah, yeah. so, um, but that's uh, derailtrainsofthought.blogspot.com. Which is also kind of, I, I kind of started the this show as kind of like your sister show, mm -hmm. which we hardly ever acknowledge, but, you know, it's technically the sister show to the podcast. One of these days we should do a crossover. <laughs> like a, it, that guy with the glasses style. So we'll do a video. Isn't that what this is? Sort of. So we'll do a video <laughs> version of ours and an audio version of yours. <laughs> Wait, <see that? laughs> do a video version of Daryl Trends of Thought and an audio version of, of my show. Oh, okay, okay. I got you. That could actually be really <laughs> good. <laughs> Which incidentally, Daryl Trains is also on YouTube now, along with Yes. So, yes. So if yeah. you if you don't like downloading MP3s for some reason. You can listen to it on, on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, in case you want to be weird, you can actually get House of the House of House of the Living. House yeah. of the Living. I keep wanting to say House of Healing for whatever reason. No. no but you can get that. You can download that by itself. But yes. the cool thing is, is that it's available in print only in the book only in the book and, and it's nice and at this print. point exclusively in print I, I it's there. worth it yeah I mean they'll, because then you get the both stories together and they just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, might, you might as well have both yep. well yeah so. most definitely now you just need to do that with all of the, the Vienna stories which is what I contributed to yeah at some point all right. Well, thank you guys for ha for being here, and thank you all for for joining us this week on But I Digress. This is Nate Marchan signing off. Chan, signing off. Bye-bye. That's all we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> I had to do it real quiet. <laughs> 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 <laughs>